Hi, this is John Reed. I got the old school guest of the year, VJ VJ Sankar, IBM. How's it going? Very good. Great to be back. Been a while. Feels, feels like it's been a long time, man. But some of these uh, online conferences we had in the past were some of the best chats. So hopefully we can do it justice today. Sure, hope so. So uh, for those of you uh, catching this, we're going to be hitting on a topic that came up in in the back channel with VJ and I, and it has to do with hiring, specifically around the challenge of of, of, of data science skills and sort of powering the so-called AI workforce from a human side. And the reason this really struck a chord with me is because I really preach this gospel that that, uh, essentially the companies don't do enough, even within, say, the U.S. or any geography, but just take the U.S., to reach out to much more diverse and underserved workforces and train them up and all that stuff. Well, VJ on this topic came at me from a totally different perspective because his view is, with this particular set of skills, it's very, very hard to find enough qualified people. And so I want to learn more about that and, and, and how he's creatively approaching that. So let's just take a step back here and just tell me about like the, the kinds of skills that you really need that are hard to find and, and how that's going for you. Yeah, so um, to, to frame that discussion right on where I come from, if I look at the last three years that I, I spent at IBM, and I first supported uh, three different industries like utilities, uh, media and entertainment, uh, telco. Then I ran the analytics uh, AI consulting business for North America, supporting all the industries. Uh, then I was the North America CTO for a while. And now I run one of our large financial services accounts. So I came at this from a few different perspectives. Um, so hopefully can provide a, a, a balanced view of the problem. So uh, first things first, there are a lot of uh, jargon problems in, in this area to begin with, right? So uh, people get uh, very hung up on, is it AI? Is it machine learning? Uh, oh, isn't it classic analytics? Is regression really machine learning and, and, and so on? Um, while it is interesting to debate academically what the big differences are in terminology and so on, this is pretty much a relook at you know the past when we were all haggling about you know is it BI is it analytics you know is it reporting and, and so on. It is not the highest value problem to be tackled at the moment. The highest value problem to be tackled is uh, who can solve uh, the the big ticket issues that that my clients have, right? And for that. One thing I, I realized early was that it is not one data scientist who who solves problems. It is a combination of skills which usually one person doesn't have. And I have gotten into trouble with friends in the past for writing a post that said there are no data scientists in the wild. Um, and the, my, my general point there is for data science to be useful to a, a business, it needs to be a team sport. It needs some, you know, statistics type uh, experience. It needs some uh, computer science experience. It needs storytelling experience. It needs good visualization experience. It needs a lot of domain experience, which all combined in one person uh, makes it a unicorn and, you know, consequently makes it very hard. And a lot of people who recruit data scientists um, often don't think about this uh, team nature of this work and then get very frustrated later when it doesn't give them the type of benefit that uh, that they want, right? So that is how I would frame the problem up front. This is why hiring this perfect data scientist uh, is tough. I, I think if you rephrase the problem to can we find the perfect data scientist team or data science team, um, I think we will have a lot more success in, in solving this uh, skills problem. Because they are not always going to be in the in the same person. Does that make sense, John? Yeah, I think you hit on a couple of really important things there. Um, first, in terms of definitions, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the difference between AI and machine learning and and automation on this particular discussion. But I think, to me, what resonates the most is I, I interviewed a, a company the other day that's using uh, AI type stuff for recruiting and. What he ultimately said to me is, I don't know if this is AI or 
uh, this might just be a really well-written program. All I know is that I'm getting results with it. And that's kind of what I'm looking at right now is, is right now the role of machines as I see it is to automate the mundane and automate the transactional and automate things that free people up for higher value work. And if you can also help them make decisions and start developing alerts infrastructures and, and help predict things, then that's even better. Is that an acceptable framework, do you think, for our discussion? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, right? I mean, we, we should think about not, not just in, um, in, in AI, but in general, computing in general, right? Um, is it solving an, uh, an efficiency problem or is it solving an effectiveness or efficacy problem, right? Um, two, two very different things. Automation um, as a general theme has always been great at solving the efficiency problem, doing more with less, the efficacy problem, the effectiveness of the solution, slightly different, right? Because these are uh, dependent on us being able to ask uh, questions that were not asked before and um, software trying to figure out answers that it was not capable of finding. Them. So uh, the AI kind of uh, spreads between these two axes, right? If we think about efficiency and effectiveness as two axes um, of the problem space, uh, AI kind of covers both. Most of the narrow solutions that we, we do are very high value on the efficiency space. Um, like in, in recruiting, if you have to go through a, a hundred thousand CVs that came in through your portal, uh, AI is probably a, a great solution in getting it shortlisted. It also will come with a ton of problems like bias and other things that you know we consciously or unconsciously didn't take care of, right? So uh, everything comes at a price, but at least it is better than you know, spending uh, three months trying to go through a uh, hundred thousand uh, CDs when you really need the guy or, or gal, you know, the next day at work. Yeah, and I totally agree on the other principle around the around the team uh, concept here, and that you know, this isn't really about you know some rock star coming in and 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 sort of waving the magic data science wand. Uh, recently, I went to an industrial analytics session put on by Baker Tilly, and they were describing a scenario where. They had run a bunch of advanced analytics. Uh, this was for uh, an airplane parts manufacturer that was having some issues they were trying to hone in on. And it wasn't until they sat down with the engineers and the specialists and the managers with the data that that's when the light bulb started to go off, right? So they were able to crunch numbers and, and provide information that, that that customer didn't have, but it was sitting down with the domain experts you know, that, that have been in that field for 20 years and looking at that, and they were immediately able to say, oh, okay, I, I see why this is an issue, right? And they they couldn't have done that just coming in with a wagon load of smart consultants. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely important, right? If we don't solve a problem uh, in the context of that industry and that customer in particular, uh, AI is of low value, right? I mean, there are two uh, classic examples to make the case. One um, you know, most of us have heard about correlation doesn't indicate causation, right? I mean, that is very well understood. Uh, but if you're exploring a, a large data set, you will find a lot of correlations. And most of them uh, might not indicate causation. But what is perhaps less understood is that correlation also doesn't convey importance. Just because you found something statistically valid and it might be uh, sufficient for causation, it still doesn't mean it is important for uh, that business, you wouldn't know as a math geek or as a computer science expert whether that is important for the business till you talk to uh, somebody from the business, right? The domain expert. The second, um, uh, you know, classic case is uh, false positives and false negatives, right? Uh, uh, a good use case of AI is diagnostics, right? Why a machine went wrong, or you know, or in another context, uh, say diagnosing uh, a disease. Uh, you have to ask this question, right? If a false positive comes or a false negative comes, what is better? What should the system do? Should we tell somebody who has a disease that he doesn't have a disease or somebody who does not have a disease that you have a disease, right? I mean, this is not very easy for a machine to make a determination. It needs uh, a human doctor or in the case of a machine, um, you know, a production supervisor to uh, to take a call. So those are all, I mean, those are two simple, straightforward examples. But, you know, within those uh, ranges is a ton of things that um, a data scientist might might not be aware. Now, 
often you know people who have worked in that field for a long time even if they are not business facing do pick up these skills and eventually at some point might be uh, great at, at bringing that domain knowledge but still right somebody who is close to the business whose life is affected by the decisions that the ai system makes that person should have a say and should understand clearly transparently what is happening behind this right so as we hone in on on the skill sets that are hardest to find let's take this i i realize every customer is is kind of different but let's 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 take the scenario of a project like the type that you've been involved with. What skills do you look for from this team for the customer to provide, and, and what skills do you look to provide from your side? So um, some customers, um, especially the one that I support now, are very, very savvy on AI. Right? They have been doing machine learning for a long time, even before you know it became fashionable. Um, you know, like fraud analytics and so on has been around right. for decades, right? So uh, I can't really teach them anything that they don't know on on, on that front, right? So uh, the trouble there usually is um, they may, may not be aware of what is happening in other industries that they can uh, learn from uh, because AI is solving magnificent problems uh, in multiple industries. And uh, if you don't know what is happening elsewhere, you probably will spend a lot of time relearning, uh, reinventing the wheel, and so on. Right. So I, I provide some value in in cross pollinating that information across clients, across industries, um, which you know hopefully is high value for the client. The second difficulty is there are also new research, um, you know, that that crops up in AI from time to time, which unless you are in this business full time, it's very difficult to uh, keep on top of, right? I cannot keep on top of everything that happens. But thankfully, you know, my employer has a significant investment in research. So I get to talk to the researchers and get a, a nutshell of what they are working on, what breakthroughs are happening. And if something I can correlate to my client's problems is there, then I can ask for a deep dive. Some of the times what I find is, I need to go brush up on my math and stats skills uh, before I can get a, a full appreciation. And this, in, in turn, affects my hiring decisions quite, quite a lot, too. There are a lot of algorithms that come um, prepackaged or you know, models, for that matter, you know, if you come from the statistics side of the world. Um, they, you know, they abstract away the need for people to understand uh, the mathematics behind how these things work, but it also comes with certain limitations that if you don't understand the first principles of how a solution was arrived at, you're very limited um, in terms of the value that you can add because then you're essentially picking, you know, it's like a multiple choice answer that, you know, you're, you're just picking one answer out of many, which in many cases would be still higher value than what a client has, but, um, you know, you're limited. You're not really going to uh, stretch the value much, much bigger than that. So I do expect my data scientists to have a, a good mathematics uh, understanding, statistics understanding. So they understand the first principles of how, um, you know, their solution works and can explain in simple terms what has happened. Um, like a, a, a good example um, that I, I ran into um, recently was, um, you know, creating odds for uh, investment decisions. Um, and while there are very sophisticated models and the model will give some, um, you know, indication of the accuracy of its prediction, people start taking it very binary, right? So, for example, you know, there are two options. Option A is, has 55% odds and option B has 45% odds. Um, that shouldn't uh, equate to uh, a, a human interpreting that, okay, let me double down on option A because it has higher odds. Um, because people don't generally understand probability uh, and you know concepts like that very easily, so it is important uh, for me when I hire people that their first principles grasp of their domain is uh, is high. Um, I I put a lot of value on that, and, and also uh, you know there uh, a level of pragmatic. Um, it shouldn't um, you know a lot of things you cannot learn in college. But, you know, there are pragmatic limitations in, in how much you can work with. Like, for example, how much data do you really need? What kind of compute environment do you really need? Are you aware of uh, where the best algorithms and the best data sets reside that can add value to what you're analyzing now? 
those are things, right, that curiosity element that makes people explore beyond what they learn in college uh, is of significant value too, right? So those are all things that I generally poke a lot when I um, interview and, and, and select folks to work in our team. Right. So you've talked about the difficulty of hiring folks in the U.S. with with some of these skills. What are the skills that, that are really proving most difficult from from that standpoint? So the, there are a few universities, you know, like Carnegie Mellon and um, you know, New York State and Northwestern and so on, where, you know, we, we go and recruit every year in, in some volume. So we get good, good, great students from there. And most of them have uh, prior experience before they did their master's. But it is a small uh, set of people compared to the demand in, in the market. It is only a, a very small set of people. And they are pure data scientists, right? I mean, they learn data science for a couple of years. They do, you know, capstone projects and, and so on. And they're very well prepared. And, you know, they have a very short learning curve to, uh, to be where they, they need to be. Um, you know, and then so, they when, can, so when you say they're pure data scientists, break that out a little bit. Do they have uh, advanced mathematical degrees as well? Uh, like, well, when you say pure data scientists, how many, would you define many, that? Many of them do, right? Either advanced mathematic, uh, mathematics degrees or engineering uh, backgrounds where, you know, you do need a significant mathematics uh, as part of your curriculum to, um, you know, to pass that course. So, um they may not they, under, they understand how algorithms are constructed and they could probably construct their own. Or I would like to think if they don't, then somehow I would have spotted it and not recruited them. Right. So, right. Uh, <laughs> um, so that, that part is, uh, is important, right? That the depth of that skill. Now I'm not saying that every single person with the data science, um, you know, title or a data scientist title needs to be that way, but you do need several of these people. Uh, because there should be somebody, you know, who has that first principles understanding in the team um, to explain. But it's probably less important when they talk to other data scientists, but it is very important when they explain it to a client, right? A non-data scientist person, um, you know, how they arrived at that conclusion, what the system is actually doing and what are the caveats that should go with it. So that is um, a, a basic um, requirement that, a significant part of that data scientist population in a team uh, ideally should should be first principles savvy. And this math background does help. Now, when I say math background helps, uh, sometimes they do understand the maths really well, but they still have a problem interpreting that in, um, uh, in simple language. So uh, that is uh, just about as bad as, um, you know, uh, the, the prior case where they don't have the math knowledge. What I need is them understanding first principles and then being able to explain in uh, in simple language to uh, to their clients. So it's 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 a complicated skill. It, it is something that perhaps universities could do better uh, in in educating them. There are um, you know other other things that are considered optional um, in the university curriculum that I really strongly feel should be. Uh, core curriculum. One is this ability to explain. The other is, you know, things like fairness, ethics, right, of of AI. These folks will be working with um, high-value data sets and solving big problems in, in their career. And a, a topic like ethics cannot be um, an optional subject. It cannot be an elective. It should be part of the, the, the core curriculum. They should not wait till they're halfway through their career to realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. It's interesting because you're kind of describing kind of a rare combination of a mix, a, a strange blend of liberal arts sensibilities and, and hardcore math science sensibilities because that the ethical, ethical and sociological implications and the privacy implications, that's, that's, that's not taught in the hardcore science curriculums nearly as often. Yeah, that, 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 I, as far as I know, there are no core curriculum components that teach these things. Right? There are electives in, in some colleges that teach this. And I right. strongly believe that it cannot be an elective. It needs to be part of the core curriculum. And I, absolutely, you're spot on. I truly feel that uh, all engineers need a, a dose of liberal arts education while they are in college. Or at least get their curiosity raised on there is this other discipline that they can tap into while they are still young and impressionable, so that they 
they continue to learn after they finish their formal education. Yeah, it's interesting because you what you kind of described is that if I I could be a data science rock star with an advanced math degree, but if I lack a certain understanding of, for example, uh, you know, data privacy issues across cultures or across organizations, or if I'm not able to to communicate effectively and think critically, then I'm not I'm going to be a very limited use to you. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And- yeah, it, it, absolutely important. And also, I think the other, you know, gross injustice, um, you know, from their younger days is uh, how their expectations are set on what their day-to-day life will be. A, a significant portion of their life will be just wrangling data and getting it into a shape that, you know, they can, you know, do their advanced work on. And many of them walk into the job assuming that somebody else would have done that job for them. Right. Uh, and then they get very frustrated. Um, this also, I think, um, could be addressed very early in the career. I, I tried to talk to them, um, you know, right in the interview process to set their expectations straight. And I continue to talk to them throughout their initial years in the team. Uh, because there are uh, simple things that, you know, you, if you don't have your expectations set on this, you uh, probably will get way too frustrated and um, and quit. Um and you know your your dreams will be crashed for and for no good reason. I mean, this is all; these are all interesting problems to solve. Uh, but it, it is a problem, and you know, data you you will be very lucky to get what is called clean data. I haven't really seen clean data come at me in in any project in my life. Yeah, I keep seeing surveys that that confirm what you're saying and and report that data scientists should expect that that data manipulation, cleansing, and quality is going to be a a significant chunk of what they do, whether they would like that <laughs> or whether they enjoy that work or not. And it, 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 it's almost like if the CEO of an organization's also got to be the janitor in a way you have to be the, the, the cleaner of your own data and, and not expect someone else to do that for you. Yeah. And it, it is actually an excellent point that you make there, John, actually most CEOs, right. I mean, you know, over, over, a, over the last several years, right. I have had several CEOs as my clients. Um, there is a, a janitor nature to some of their decision making. You know, oftentimes the CEO will have to look at conflicting data and make a decision, right? Like their business unit presidents might make one forecast, their finance, you know, CFO organization may, might make another forecast. Market analysts might give him a third view of the world. Um, and he has to somehow, he or she has to somehow come to uh, a complex conclusion, looking at uh, data that might contradict themselves, right? It's uh, uh, that that wrangling, although it's not you know Python work that he does. Um, you know, it's still you you have to rationalize in your mind that you know not uh, you know this data driven decision making has that one uh, limitation that at the very top um, it is very rare that you know everything is clean and you you often have to. Uh, make a decision with incomplete data, despite all AI, ML, BI, ERP, and, you know, other assorted things we all do. Yeah, I often think that modern success in, in our world now, in the so-called data economy, it, it's all about moving out of your comfort zone. Whatever you are most comfortable in, and think you're good at, you're going to have to learn something that you're not as comfortable or good with in order to to be effective, right? So you're going to have to know how to talk to programmers. You're going to have to know how to be more technical. Technical people need to understand business process and design. And so, you know, no matter where you sit, you've got to be willing to push a little bit if you're going, if you want to be relevant. Yeah, no, I, I, I to- totally true, right? I mean, and some some things, right, that are just honest mistakes that you don't realize till sometime later in life. You know, a, a good example is how you visualize what you found out from your analysis. Uh, I always say that the simplest visualizations are the best. If you uh, give a chart with like 17 lines going this way and that way, it's pretty tough to understand for anybody other than the person who created that chart, right? Or putting a pie chart can give uh, very different ideas to people. Um, I often tell people don't don't put pie charts on on your presentations for that reason. Right. Uh, so there are those kinds of things that you know if you're taught early in your career, you you can probably live with less grief, um, you know, o- o- over the time. Uh, but you know, we we all make mistakes that you know in hindsight look like totally avoidable if only we thought through. Right. So so what do you do in this situation when when you have all these projects pending? 
Uh, and and you don't have enough people, really. Like you said, there's only so many people you can hire from certain schools. Does that mean you're – are you hiring outside the U.S. more? Are you uh, – trying to get creative like like how do you handle these shortfalls at the moment yeah so um you know one college is limited given there are only so many uh, students you know that that come out of college every year and you know we get our fair share and other companies compete for the same talent so that's um, the first avenue the second avenue would i have been hiring outside the u.s and you know bringing folks uh, on a temporary visa or doing um, that work remotely um, but USCIS has tougher uh, visa requirements now, so that is not always easy. Plus, there are company policies that are clients that often, um, you know, do not allow their data to be, um, you know, shipped offshore for for analysis. Uh, where we can solve those problems that outside the US is a is a fair solution. But then there are still other um, issues like you know expertise in say ERP. You want to add. Um, you know, machine learning to your ERP solutions. It is not enough that you know um, uh, the uh, the machine learning aspect. You also need to know the process, right? How how does code to cash work in in an ERP? Is not something that you can teach a data scientist in in two days. It's it's tough, right? So um, for you to and it is also tough to to teach. Um, you know, machine learning to a, an ERP specialist in, in a couple of days or weeks. So it is important that we cross-pollinate knowledge um, between these two teams that where we see repeated patterns, like, for example, a machine learning in ERP is a thing. Um, you know, it's it's high value and um, there are repeated uh, problems to be solved there. So it makes a lot of sense to give introductory training to the ERP specialists on on machine learning, right? We are not the only company doing that. I'm sure there are um, other people doing that. And in in return, uh, the machine learning folks also get some business process knowledge, especially where it is um, repeated patterns. Then you know it is it's very important for them to know that. So we we cross pollinate that. Um, then um, testing is another very interesting aspect, right? Because these um, these are not deterministic systems, right? Like, for example, you can ask a question on what is my invoice total um, today? And if you ask that same question tomorrow, an SAP system will give us the same answer, hopefully the same answer. If the answer is different, there should be a very good reason why that happened. Whereas uh, the questions that we typically ask um, a machine learning system, uh, it is not always uh, going to be the same answer. There will be minor differences between how the system answers today and tomorrow in many cases. Not in all cases, but in many cases. That means testing now needs a paradigm shift, and they need to understand how AI works, how training a model works, uh, how bias um, you know needs to be minimized, and so on. So testing is another competency that will get uh, disruptive. Uh, project management, yet another... Um, you know, critical critical aspect where it is not um, very easy to do blueprinting uh, type, you know, uh, uh, strict approaches on, on how an AI project should work. So that discipline also needs some uh, some rethinking on, on how to manage uh, a machine learning project or an AI project. So we do a bunch of uh, cross-training. And... Um, so there, there are many such levers that, you know, in a small way, you can tweak several levers and, and solve this problem. But I uh, honestly believe, and, and, you know, one good thing that has happened is um, there are uh, data science boot camps and, uh, you know, these uh, online courses have become mainstream. So um, the distribution channels have become uh, much easier these days, right? So if you want to learn the basics of machine learning, and you have a month to devote uh, nights and weekends or whatever, most people can get up to speed very quickly, right? So that is one huge benefit that the times that we live in, we have that we never used to have in the past. So all, all these things, right? I mean, a combination of these things, no one thing that solves, solves our problems, but a combination of these things helps solve the problem. Yeah, and it sounds to me like we, we have a situation where you you can't sugarcoat the fact that if you want to be a hardcore data scientist by your standards, uh, it's really important to have that, uh, you know, mathematical uh, discipline and background. And so for those of you listening that, that aspire to that part of the role, 
you, you gotta, you gotta pursue it. And whether it's formal schooling, I hear your, what you're saying about online, but, and I think that can work, but I think you have to have a lot of self-discipline to teach yourself advanced math concepts online. That's not a simple thing. That's not like learning content marketing or something, which I've done online. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but I think you can do it. It's just, you have to have some determination. This is true, right? This is very true. And I think our school systems, right? I mean, the earlier we catch and solve these problems, uh, the lesser trouble we have uh, later. Uh, the math problem, um, and this is not, you know, ML alone that, that uh, you know, eventually has a math problem. I mean, the, the quality of research work that happens in the world, everything has a tie back to math. Um, one thing I have noticed, um, you know, in, in my lifetime is, the way uh, kids are taught math, um, you know, it is not surprising that many people either don't like math or are afraid of math. Um, and I think that is um, a good indication that we should revisit how math is taught early in life in schools and, um, you know, high schools and uh, and, and colleges. Um, because once you get into your grad school, it's it's fine because you are not going to go for an applied math or advanced math class if you are not good at math. But the, the formative years, we should start teaching math in a in a in a better way, especially important in schools where you know simple things like you know the definition of pi or the Pythagorean theorem, um, they all have practical applications. And if we teach them those applications early enough and show them how math and nature works together and so on, kids will hopefully have lesser fear for math. And, you know, once you get the, the primary concept straight, um, then, you know, you can build on that. It is very difficult, as you rightly said, if you um, did not take math seriously in your early years. It's not like it is not doable, but it is a lot harder um, uh, to learn later. Um, and I think it is a problem that we should we should catch in, in school time itself and, and, and solve for it. Yeah, because I think there's a few different pieces to this problem, right? There's an individual problem which is you need to keep your career alive and 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 if you listen to this you have some good tips for doing that there's a corporate problem which is you have to satisfy your clients needs this quarter and the next quarter and beyond and there's a bigger educational system problem which is this is just one more example of how our educational system is really really poorly aligned with with the types of jobs and types of careers that are available now you know and, and this isn't anything new, but I think it's gotten worse. I mean, when I when I look at when I I'm not we you and I haven't talked that much about college and like what we did next. But when I graduated from my sort of hippie alternative liberal arts college, when I look back, I'm really grateful for all the s stuff I learned around writing and critical thinking. And, you know, you talk about ethics. We were all over that. But then I also spent a lot of time learning about, you know, deconstructing the economic system, but not much time learning about how to function within it. Uh, I never took a class on on resumes. I never took a class on creating a business plan. I never took a, a class on analyzing or building a spreadsheet. You know, none of that stuff ever happened. None of the applied stuff. I did take some advanced math in high school that I think has helped me later on. And I was lucky for that. But there was a really big missing piece there. And I think if you look at most curriculums today, even the good ones, there's a real there. You're going to find some huge holes and then you have to figure out how to compensate for that later in life. Oh, abs absolutely true. Right. I mean, because I can tell you the the reverse side of that story, given I had a, a technical education, um, you know, I went to an engineering school um, and, you know, eventually later learned, you know, later went to a business school. Um, I had the reverse problem, right? I was good at math, good at physics you know, mechanics and mechanics and, and so on. But uh, didn't get a chance till later in life to uh, uh, educate myself on uh, the liberal arts side, right? Um, I I was very fond of history. You know, give, my grandfather was a history professor, so he gave me a good start. But during my college years, uh, I completely missed out on that, right? So my understanding of how uh, societies evolve, ethics, and so on, um, it would have been a whole lot uh, more useful if I got a strong foundation in college, which I did not. Um, and had to pick it up later. Thankfully, I had good mentors in, in most of those disciplines that um, I thought I, I eventually could catch up. But um, yeah, I, I think that the education system, right, that one of the easier ways to solve this problem is to go to the early years, right, and make sure that the next generation has 
uh, a more solid, more uh, broad-based education system, um, you know, than than you know, our generation had. Yeah, and you look at things like uh, you know wanting to make sure that that no one's excluded from learning how to code, right? That you'd like to think that instead of you know, I think there's a cliche that oh, the next generation is so digitally savvy, and that is true. I mean, they're growing up with smart devices in ways that that you and I never could have dreamed of growing up with smart devices so young. But but do they know how those applications are coded? Have they coded applications themselves? Have they have they looked under the hood of that? And 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 do they feel competent and encouraged to do that? I mean, to me, that's that's a really big thing because. You have to learn how to be a maker if you want to succeed in this economy, not just a consumer. And I think that's the big misconception is, oh, I'm a savvy digital consumer. Well, I'm sorry, but knowing how to scroll through your Facebook stream faster than someone twice your age is not going to do it. No, no. <laughs> Somebody on Facebook, um, you know, one of the guys uh, I used to work at SAP with uh, recently, <laughs> recently made this comment that um, – the fact that uh, you can drive a car doesn't qualify to, you know, qualify you as a car manufacturer. Yeah, very, very, very two very different things, right? So, yeah, yeah. So I think this whole digitally native thing. I think we have stretched uh, the value prop <laughs> quite, quite far. Yeah, well, and and things come full circle too because I think you told me recently that that you were thinking of of rolling up your sleeves more with with doing some hands on machine learning and algorithm building yourself. Is that still something you're thinking about doing? Yeah, yeah I, I, I still do that. I, I picked up that a, a few years ago and, you know, usually spent uh, my, my plane rides. I have, you know, long plane rides most weeks. So that's what I, I try to do to keep myself sharp. And usually most uh, most quarters I, I manage to, to get at least one new skill or at least develop empathy for the folks who are actually doing the work. And it, it does help have more meaningful um, conversations also helps hire better quality talent because once you know you know how difficult or easy something is you can calibrate you know what are the type of skills you need to to succeed in this market are the are the experts on your teams impressed with your endeavors or do they no feel no, you have no. a long way to go no my <laughs> my god <laughs> thankfully i i don't have a, a direct team of engineers anymore in my my current role but um at least I, I was realistic that, you know, I wouldn't uh, question their expertise. Uh, you know, I mean, I always granted them that they are bigger experts on the topic than, than I am. Just that I can make uh, informed decisions on their behalf. And uh, right. yeah, that that's pretty much the extent to which I, I, I would dwell on their work. You can talk to them without needing an interpreter present, which is something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh yeah, as as long as I don't do code reviews for them, I think they generally let me be. There's one final question I think is kind of important to touch on, which is when you when you talked originally about recruiting uh, excellent data scientists from these, you know, elite institutions and stuff. The the real flag that comes up for me there is just challenges with diversity, right? Because the more you hire from elite institutions, the more challenges you have in terms of hiring from a fairly privileged applicant pool what are your thoughts in general on just this field and the impact of diversity it is a it's a complex problem John, right it, um, one that many of us are actively trying to um, to mitigate and, and and make the world a little better more more inclusive right um, there are two two aspects to this right one uh, we we do need to hire uh, more people from diverse backgrounds, right, based on gender, race, you know, ethnicity, all, all, all those dimensions. And it, it is pretty tough because, you know, how much ever hard you try, there are always more dimensions than you can, you can take care of. Um, but you have to make a start, right? You cannot wait for the perfect solution where every dimension is taken care of. So start somewhere. Start with gender, perhaps, right, or, or ethnicity, right, or, or whatever. Start somewhere, right? It is still a lot better to act than think about a perfect solution that might be far into the future, right? So that is one principle that I I very firmly uh, uh, believe in. But we do have um, that problem significantly in uh, the world of AI. And it, it happens in, in various different forms. Like, for example, when we hire from college, I don't see this problem uh, an awful lot, right? I mean, there are plenty of women uh, who are doing grad school courses um, in these top institutions. So when we go to the uh, tier one universities and hire, not as much of a problem, 
we we do find plenty of talent in fact uh, the superstars in my team um, majority are are women uh, from the from the younger consultants but they do have um, other challenges like along the way you know many of them uh, um, you know either move on to other things or you know stop uh, working in this domain and so on so by the time uh, leadership positions um, are considered I, i don't think um, you know across the industry we have done a fabulous job with with diversity right um, and this will not solve just by um, you know taking care of the top of the funnel right i think top of the funnel we we do have um, more diverse candidates coming in it's a lot better than for example when when i started my career but um, middle of the funnel as in when we get into the first leadership roles to the top leadership roles um it will continue to be a problem unless we fundamentally change how we how we operate um in in this industry uh, thankfully there are more um women role models more um uh, you know uh, different ethnicity uh, role models and so on like uh, clearly i'm not a woman so it's hard to uh, say from first hand experience but i can tell you from the ethnicity side right when i first came to this country uh it was not common to be an sap consultant and also be an indian and uh, you know being treated fairly uh that is not true anymore right now there are plenty of indians um so it is not uh, you don't stand out in a crowd you you can um you know you can be more you, you are more accepted right in in case uh, there are uh, many german friends uh, that i have who helped me through the first part of my career who now uh tease me saying that now you in turn should should turn around and help us navigate the situation given now there are less germans and more indians um and that is true i didn't notice that consciously but you know when they tease me i i realized that you know that's a that's a fair thing so when um, you know that that gives me some confidence that you know these these problems will go away but this problems wouldn't have gone away if my german and american friends actively help me um, in in the first part of my career i would have given up so mm. i have some um, while totally not first hand and you know when you don't have first hand information it is tough to draw parallels but i would uh, go on a limb and say that um, as long as we all have approach to to solving this problem mm. and doing what is right for uh, the next person too as opposed to just for us this problem will get solved right again you know i've now been in the workforce for 20 plus years and i have seen um, you know how uh, you know the the indian community in in computing uh, you know got better respect and more representation along the way and with you know people like satya nadella and uh, sundar pichai holding very high offices and being role models for many of us um, so that gives me um, some confidence that with like people like indra nui and jini romiti and so on holding high offices there are more women who will aspire to do well and uh, there will be more men around them who will include them throughout the careers as opposed to just focusing on any one part like top of the funnel i, I think these are all things that are solvable it just needs the the current incumbents the current majority to to think differently act differently i think i think we all think differently it's a, it's a bigger question of whether we act differently Yeah and I think the other big piece of the puzzle which we won't talk about any further today you alluded to it earlier but uh it's then the challenge when we look at these tools which have become very powerful in their own right when you look at uh for example the power of a Facebook al- algorithm or the power of a Google algorithm we've already seen how those things can get us into a lot of trouble in terms of reinforcing bias uh but those tools can also be used to to get rid of human bias in certain ways if they're if they're designed well so that's that's a whole longer discussion but i think we then have to take that same mindset and make sure we're not duplicating it in the tool but also taking advantage of the fact that sometimes machines can be more quote unquote impartial than we can in a way that that does help us with these issues okay it can help or hurt right i mean we just need to be very thoughtful because the the idea of automation is that it will increase efficiency and if we are not very careful right and you know all the bad things that we have historically done will get amplified and if we are thoughtful all the good things that we want to do also will get amplified it just needs us to be more more thoughtful yep design for inclusion i guess is sort of the, the exactly. thought there 
Exactly. So, right. Well, great. That was an excellent discussion, BJ. Any final thoughts before we move on into uh, into the the less fun part of our day? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we had a, a fabulous discussion. I mean, these are all topics very very close to my heart, and I know it's very close to your heart as well, right? So it's it's always fun to catch up on this. Yeah, and I and I'll try to put this out there in such a way that young younger people thinking about this field will will get a hold of this because I think that's particularly uh, something that I would want people to be thinking about so they can avoid making some of the mistakes I know I did and maybe you think you did as well. So, <laughs> all right, well, I've got a little editing to do and hopefully I can get rid of the construction noises, but I think for the most part that was pretty clean. So thanks for your time, BJ, and look forward to continuing the discussion. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. Really love okay. it. All right, Thank you. later.